Hi, my name is David Hicks. Welcome to the series on how to use a whiteboard for all it is worth. Okay, no, wait, no. The, uh, we're doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount. Excuse me. Those teachings of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 with occasional references to some of Je uh, Jesus' teachings that are in the Sermon on the Plain found in Luke chapter 6. In the Sermon on the Plain, Luke says that Jesus was standing on a flat place, hence a plain. I think it even says, you know, came down from the hill, was standing on a flat place, so we call it the Sermon on the Plain. And then in Matthew, Jesus says that Jesus was on the top of a hill, on top of a mountain. And so, obviously, hence thereof, therefore, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. So today we're going to focus on those teachings in Matthew uh, chapter 5, dealing with anger and reconciliation. Reconciliation is a big long term that just basically means to uh, bring into a relationship of peace uh, two factions or, or maybe two or more who were at odds with one another. There was anger between them. There was not peace between them. There was uh, something keeping them from getting along and so reconciliation is taking care of whatever it was that was keeping them from getting along and bringing back together those that were formerly uh, again, apart or, you know, angry with one another, not at peace with one another. So we'll get to the part about reconciliation toward the end of the video. We're going to focus mostly about Jesus' teaching on anger. So let's start at Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Here Jesus is speaking, and he says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Fair enough. One of the Ten Commandments, uh, the commandments that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses was, Thou shalt not kill. Do not kill. In other words, do not murder. And so they had understood that, and they understood that if you murder somebody, you're going to be in danger of God's judgment. But Jesus takes it to a different level. Verse 22, he says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You see, that's the power of anger. Anger has the power to, to kill people before they are even dead. Now, what do I mean by that? We can hurt, we can even kill, in a manner of speaking, a person's soul, their heart, by the things that we say to them, by the things that we do to them, out of hearts filled with hatred and anger. Cruelty, wrath, all those types of things have the power to destroy people's lives. Bullying, for example, has the power to drive people to the point of suicide. You see, we can kill people's soul before they even, uh, before they're even dead physically. We can kill them spiritually. That's how bad anger is. It's because of anger that murder is often carried out. It's it's a prelude. To murder. Now, that's not the only reason that people murder, but it's certainly one of them. And so Jesus is trying to help us see the danger of anger. All right, let's keep going. Again, anyone who says to his brother Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. I know what, what, who? All right, now, Raka or Raka or however they say it, they said it was a term of insult uh, used in Jesus' day. And it means, according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, a vain or worthless fellow, someone who's a simpleton. Uh, according to Hitchcock's Bible Names Dictionary, it means uh, someone who's worthless, good for nothing. Now, the Sanhedrin refers to the ruling council of the Jews. Uh, the Sanhedrin, at least according to Wikipedia, was a group of either 23 or 71 elders appointed to sit as um, 
a tribunal, a, a group with uh, judge judging authority. They you know they have the authority to judge, educate, uh, determine claims, disputes, etc. Um, they were appointed to sit as a tribunal in every city in the ancient land of Israel. So the Sanhedrin were the ruling council that day. Um, if you had disputes and trouble, you'd go before them and, and they would give their ruling. So if you were found to use this term against someone, uh, you said that they were Raka, Raka, however you want to say it, Reike, I don't know, um, doesn't matter. Uh, that was bad enough to be brought before the council, to be brought in front of a judge, to put it in modern day terms. But... Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, what's the difference? Um, again, according to International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the term that we translate fool here uh, used to, is used to refer to a man's moral and religious character. It's not just saying, that, well, you know, that guy's slow, he's worthless, good for nothing. He, you're saying that that person is just, they're an evil person. You're attacking more than just their mind, you're attacking their heart, their character. And so it was even worse insult. Um, and the thing behind it, okay, remember our context here, is, is anger. It's something you would say to somebody out of anger, you fool! And, you know, we do that today. Uh, we'll say such things out of anger. Now, that, um, that is good, except that in a moment here, we're going to see where it seems like Jesus totally contradicts what he just taught. Now, before we look at that, I want us to understand that there is something as a righteous anger. Okay, there's anger that is unrighteous and evil, but there's also an anger born of righteousness, uh, born of a pure heart. Um, for ex and, and the Bible even teaches us to have this anger, this hatred, okay, toward that which is evil, toward that which is evil. Proverbs 8, 12, and 13 um, wisdom is speaking, and it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Anger is mixed into the definition of hate. It's a part of hating. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Psalm 9710, you who love the Lord, hate evil. Now see, I love putting those two back to back because the main two reasons for following God is either A, you, you fear him, you know, you don't want to get, he, he's got your attention, he's got your respect, and you do not want to get on his bad side. Or you love him. You've got to know his heart, you've got to know who he is and what he's about, and you love him and you want to follow him, you want to please him. Either way is fine. The better motivation is to follow God out of love, not out of fear. And hopefully if you start out of fear, you can grow into loving God. But neither motivation is condemned in the Bible. Both it's fine. But love is definitely the more admirable one and the one for which we should strive. But with either motivation, it leads you to the same conclusion. Hate evil. Hate evil. Psalms 4.4 4 and Ephesians 4.26 tells us to be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. In fact, Ephesians 4 seems to be a quote of Psalm 4.4. 4. Now, I want us to look at Ephesians 4.26 just for a moment because, to me, it's one of the most misinterpreted verses in all of Scripture. Um, because there's kind of like this myth mythological teaching associated with it and that sounds really good, and we just don't think it through. Uh, Ephesians 4, beginning at verse uh, 26, he, sa um, he says, In your anger do not sin. In this translation, uh, in your anger do not sin, and others be angry and do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. See, here it's even built into the translation. New King James says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. It doesn't say do not let the sun go down while you are angry. It says do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. You see, this isn't, a, you know, most people hear this and they say, oh, this means if you get angry, then don't, you know, by the time the sun goes down, you should stop being angry. Okay, that sounds good. It's good philosophy to have. Okay, but this is a command. This isn't a conditional saying, if you get angry, this is telling you, and again, it's a quote from Psalm 4.4, to be angry. Huh? Be angry? Yes. And what, when is it okay to be angry? Well, look at what we're being taught here. Hate evil, hate evil. Romans 12.9, says, let love be without hypocrisy. That's a, That should be a video in of itself. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let that sink in for a moment. Abhor what is evil. Abhor evil. Cling to what is good. Abhor is, is a stronger word than just hate. Um, it's more than just being angry. It's like, you hate something so much, it, it makes you sick. Okay? It's like anger and, and the, the, the desire to, to vomit all at the same time. I abhor it. It is just hatred on another level. So, yes, it is okay to be angry when it comes to things like injustice. Um, ch child abuse. Rape. Um, immorality of all sorts, meanness, cruelty, um, you know, acts of jealousy, act, you know, just all the evil, murder, all the evil that mankind does. Being angry about evil um, and hating evil, it's okay. In fact, it says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, um, which I think is a proper translation there. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, meaning... Don't stop being angry. It's not, you know, be angry, but then stop it before the sun goes down. It's, you know, Elton John sang a song, don't let the sun go down on me, meaning don't let our relationship come to an end. I think that's how Paul is using that term. Don't let the sun go down on that anger, on that hatred of evil, is the implication in my humble David Hicks opinion. So with that understanding in mind, let's look at where it seems like Jesus is about to totally contradict what we read in Matthew 5, where, you know, he's talking about whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, didn't emphasize that phrase enough, is, will be in danger of hell fire. All right, so let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Here Jesus is going to lambast, if you will. I, I wrote chew out. Um, if you've ever played sports, um, the vast majority of, uh, majority of us who have played sports have been chewed out by our coaches um, at one point or another. Um, okay, I want to, I, I need to, something was bothering me and I want to say it real quick. Um, in Matthew 5.22, it says, but I tell you that Anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. That's the New International Version translated that way. There is a reference there that says some manuscripts, um, brother without cause. In other words, if you're angry with your brother without a reason. Okay, anyway, that's where that reference came from because it felt like, no, wait a minute, we didn't read that. So where's that coming from, David? And so I needed to flag that, that some manuscripts have that phrase in it. All right. So Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is going to lambast the teachers of the law and the Pharisees want to chew them out. And as I was saying, if you've ever played sports, at some point your coach has probably yelled like crazy at you for something you did wrong. Now, side point, coaches, can you just calm it down? Can you find ways to get your point across without shouting so much? Especially those of you who teach kids. Come on. All right? 
I, yeah, that that's just you know we yeah that that that's I, mm, mm, it's, I'm on my soapbox. I gotta get off of it so we can focus on this. All right, Matthew chapter twenty three. Um, but yeah, don't ask me how mad I got that one year I did teach middle school math. That we, we won't look at that sin, will we? Uh, that beam in my own eye. All right. The Pharisees were the strictest sect of Jews in Jesus' day. They had laws, rules, regulations for just about anything. They even had some rules and regulations about how you could get out of stuff. So we'll probably see a little bit of here. The teachers of the law refer to those who devoted themselves to teaching the Old Testament laws, the, the law of Moses, those commandments, uh, including the Ten Commandments that God gave to Israel through Moses, and, and as well as the writing of the prophets, those kinds of things, um, the, right, the, script, the portion of Scripture that was already there in Jesus' day, they were experts, in theory, on, on the law. And they, so they taught it to the people. But Jesus, in Matthew 23, uh, criticizes them mightily, heavily. In fact, as Jesus um, goes through this uh, chewing out of the Pharisees and teachers' law, these are some of the terms that he used. Hypocrites, son of hell, blind guides, blind fools. He didn't just say, you fool. He said, blind fools. Snakes, brood of vipers. Oh, let's read some of it so you can you can get the context and you can get what he's saying and why he is saying it. Uh, we'll start at verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Now, hypocrite is a word that literally means actor. So in other words, they were acting like they were following God, but they weren't. Now, in their hearts, they were, you know, convinced that what, you know, some were probably, there. there's basically two different types of hypocrites. There's one that they know they're acting. They know they're faking it. They don't really believe what they're saying. You know, they don't really believe in God or, or believe in following him but they're faking it for whatever reason. Um, but then there's those, um, or at least they, yeah, but then there are those who, they sincerely believe they're following God. But what they're doing is completely against what God teaches and what God says. All right, so he goes on. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is, he is bound by his oath. So in other words, you could get out of it if you just swore by the temple. But if you swore by the gold of the temple, yeah, you had, you got to keep that. You, you can't get out of that one. You blind fools, which is greater? The gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater? The gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Now, part of what is making Jesus so angry here is because keeping our word is extremely important to God. God always keeps his promises. He always keeps his word. And he expects us to do the same. He teaches us to do the same. And so having all these excuses for getting out of what you're um, promising that you're going to do and for breaking your promises, breaking your oaths, you know, angers God and angers Jesus mightily. Um, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. 
So he is just going off with them. And this is the kind of a little bit of the heart and soul of, of, of the problem. They would do all the little things. Oh, oh, I've got, you know, I'll we're supposed to tithe, give a ten. Uh, in the law of Moses, you know, we gotta give ten percent. Okay, uh, here's the ten percent of my spices. But then they'll turn around and they'll be hateful. They'll be mean. Um, you know, they'll they'll commit acts of injustice. They'll be unmerciful. They won't be faithful. And so the things that are most important to God, they totally neglected while keeping all the the you know the the smaller, less important things. Um, you know, Jesus told, he said, you, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. You know, imagine you, you, you get a soup and you're, you're there eating your soup, a fly gets in it. Now for some of you, you know, it's over with, you're not touching that soup again. I, I get that. But for others, you know, you'd see, um, you'll, you'll see the gnat or, or a fly or whatever. And you, you know, somehow you'll try and get it out of your soup. Um, this Jesus is saying, yeah, you'll do that, but if you saw a camel in your soup, you'd swallow it. And, and so let me give an example of that. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were among those who paid Judas, one of Jesus' apostles, his 12 special messengers, to lead a mob to go arrest Jesus in the dead of night. Paid him 30 pieces of silver to go do that. It's 30 silver coins. Later on, Judas is remorseful. He takes the 30 silver coins and gives it back to him and says, you take this. I, this, you know, I betrayed innocent blood. He said, well, what's that to us? You see to it. And, and so Judas just throws him the money and leaves. Now he ends up goes going out and committing suicide. But they see the coins there and they say, well, we can't put this into the, you know, the the treasury money of the temple it's blood money we can't do that and so they went and they bought a field with it okay you can pay somebody to get basically to get somebody killed but you can't take that same money and mix it in with the the money of the temple huh now yeah Okay, I get the latter, but the former, hello? So anyway, that's an example, I think, of what Jesus was saying. And he goes on, and you've heard the language. You've heard some of these terms Jesus is using here. Um, so what gives? This sounds to be in complete opp opposition to what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 5. Well, okay, let's look at this for a moment. Let's think this through. In Matthew 5, Jesus is talking about, you know, being angry with your brother without a cause or, or you know, whether that phrase was in there or not. It, it, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's the heart behind the anger. And it's the heart behind why are we saying, you fool? Because a, from what we're seeing, both hate and both love can lead you to say, you fool. Huh? Well, when... We're saying this in other many, many insulting terms to people, okay? If it's born out of hate, what is our goal? Why are we saying this to this person? Why are we calling this that, that name or whatever name we're using? Our goal is to hurt them. We're angry with them. We despise them or, or whatever is going on. And so we want to take our words and use them like a knife and stab it into their soul and twist as hard as we can. That's our goal. It's not a noble goal. It's a selfish goal. We do it to make them hurt and in hoping seeing them hurt will make us feel better. So we're saying that out of cruelty, out of anger, our goal is is not a righteous goal. Our goal is evil. Our intent is evil. We're trying to hurt the person that we're calling this or whatever name. Now, what is Jesus doing here? You see, Jesus is speaking from a heart of love. God is love. Jesus is love. God wants every person to, to, to repent and be saved. Jesus wants every person to repent and be saved. What is his goal here? 
His goal isn't to hurt. His goal is to open the eyes of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to what they were actually being and what they were doing. He hated evil. Jesus hated evil. He abhorred evil. He abhorred what they were doing, and he was confronting them on it out of that passion for righteousness. Out of that passion for love for people, he was lambasting them for all the evil things they were doing to people. And his goal is not, you know, just to, oh, I just want to see them, uh, you know, uh, I just want to see them suffer. No, his goal is to try and get them to wake up and change their behavior. He is confronting them and saying, this is what you are. This is what you are doing. You see, the motivations are totally different because the source, what is in our heart, was totally different between what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5 and what Jesus was doing in Matthew 23. All right, so let's look at the last part of this. This part about reconciliation. Matthew chapter 5, verse um, 21, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 24 to 26. Uh, verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Now, this is kind of the perspective of the other person. Oh, somebody's angry with me. Um, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. It's more important for you to go and fix things between you and that brother who is angry with you than it is to go worship God. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot worship God before, you know, I mean, because maybe you talk to your brother and they're still angry with you. They'll have nothing to do with reconciliation. That doesn't mean you can't ever go worship God before that reconciliation comes, but you should at least go make an effort. Um, he keeps going. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way. Or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So here's very practical, wise advice. You, your brother's suing you and wants to, you know, and that day they could have you thrown in jail for whatever the dispute was. Go reconcile things before they throw you into jail. Reconcile things. Bring peace between you and that person who is angry with you. Uh, Romans says, you know, um, I think at the end of chapter 12, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men, as much as it, you know, is on your part. Now, having said that, I will apply that to the most important relationship in the universe. The relationship between you and God. If things aren't at peace between you and God right now, reconcile them now. Because the time of judgment and punishment is coming. That in danger of the judgment part, you know, that Jesus talked about, you know, when you say something, you're a fool, have that angry heart, hateful heart. Okay? That time of judgment is coming. And if you don't have reconciliation between you and God, the punishment is coming. And you're not getting out of there until you pay the last penny, so to speak. So, reconcile things between you and the Lord if you haven't done so. How do you do that? Put your faith in Him. Turn from evil. Turn from sin. Turn from Satan's ways to God's ways. Make that decision to follow Him. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus. For the, and God will wash away all your sins. You will be clean, a new person, born again, ready um, with a new heart to follow the Lord, to take these teachings of Christ and apply them to your life. Thank you for listening. God bless you. God bless this recording. I'm honored and humbled you've listened.